Jason Bourne is a fictional character created by uh, Robert Ludlum in books, uh, movies. How many of you are watching movies? You bad Christians. <laughs> Jason Bourne is a highly, highly trained, specialized agent of United States government who got this tremendous ability to fight, to fight the enemy, to discern every situation, to think strategically in advance and overcoming problems. Uh, but Jason Bourne has forgotten who he is. The trauma from a battle causes him to have amnesia. So he was sitting in a restaurant and he observed every car in the parking lot, memorizing every single license plate, and can close his eyes and tell details about every single customer in that restaurant. Every single one. When hearing a foreign language spoken across the table, uh, he not only understands but returns a, com uh, a, a reply in the same language. I didn't know I can speak that. And he is continuing with this question. Who do you think I am? Who am I? He lost his identity. Of course, this is an illustration. Did it ever happen to you to have a moment of, okay, who am I? And after feeling um, this, uh, to have this strange feeling that you don't know what happened to you, where you are. After moving um, years ago from Romania here, I had this strange feeling for almost a year that me is not me. It's another one. I was looking around and I said, what's going on? Where, 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 where are you? I think the old still back there. Now, did you, did you ever ask yourself, like uh, Jason Bourne, who am I? Or it was just me, because I moved here from a faraway country, not galaxy. <laughs> not sure what you believe and who you are. Did it happen to you? In uh, uh, John chapter 3, we have uh, the scripture that Sister Lori read. And we read about four things that Jesus knew about himself that we should know about ourselves. If we know those four things, they are going to be part of who we are. And they will revolutionize your walk with God. Now, the first thing Jesus knew, that Jesus fully understood about himself, was this. Jesus knew his power. Let's read verse, uh, verse 3 together here. If you have Bibles, there are some Bibles removed from the pews because um, the church consider they're wear out and we will probably um, buy new ones. But if you have your Bible, if you have your Bible in your cell phone, please follow me here. John chapter 13 verse 3. Jesus knew that the Father 
has put what? All things under his power. Wow. All things. He understood that he got full authority. And because of this understanding, he could cast out demons. He could raise people from dead. He could speak to a storm. Stand still. To rain. Don't come here anymore. We have enough. The wind and tornado. The forces of nature. They will stop. This is power. Jesus understood the power, the authority he got. And I recognize that in the church today, some people do not understand the authority that God has given us. Failing to understand that the same authority, the same power that Jesus possessed back then as one of us, the same authority that he had when he cast demon out, demons, he has today the same authority to break the chains that are binding us in our lives. He has the same power to heal broken marriages. Amen. The power to heal and to restore broken families, broken lives, broken dreams. The same power is available to you and to me. And listen to this. When you give yourself to Jesus, you gain access to his power. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20, that he is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us. If you ask. But most of the time, we are like, you know, no power, physical. I'm talking about spiritual and emotional power here. Complain, oh, pastor, I don't know about this. Nobody listens, you know. I was doing this with my neighbors. Nobody listened to us. Oh, I don't know, I'm discouraged. Where is your power? Connect your source power. The outlet's still there. Power to resist any temptation that the devil throws our way. The reason some of us are going to fail while facing the same old temptation that the devil, the devil is setting us as a trap for the 20, 30, 40 years is that because we fail to realize that God gave us access to this power. Oh, come on, Pastor, again, not again, yeah, the same cliches, the same old look around. Be realistic. The world is changed, and we are going to disappear. Really? Who do you think is this we? Who asked you to be the sports person of a disappearing church? No. Jesus understood the power that he had. And listen, the power not only gives us the upper hand over sins, but keeps us in the bondage, in power, but also enables us to, to witness. The scripture says in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, that you will receive what? Money. Oh, what? Power. When? When the... Holy Spirit is going. The power is related to the Holy Spirit. I could say the power and the Holy Spirit are one. And you will be witness where? Here in Jerusalem, in uh, uh, Judea, Samaria. Samaria, Ooh, no, I don't like that place. People are not circumcised there. Do you know that? I'm not going there, Pastor. I'm not going there. Oh, I heard that. No, no, I'm not. I'm not. I, I will, I'll stay here. Here is nice. And, and you will be my, my witnesses until the end of the earth. Experiencing that power. 
to begin with Jerusalem is the most difficult place to ministry. The place where Jesus himself was crucified. The place people believe they see it all. They don't need anything. They don't need change because they're perfect. The most difficult ground to operate. Guess, guess where? Guess what? It's church. Because people see. I heard so many sermons. I know everything. I know my Bible, Pastor. Don't tell. Is no room for you to grow? You'll be more power? No. I have everything. We're in danger here. We're in danger here. Well, stay there, Jesus. We are perfect here. Uh, <clears throat> I was working for Voice of Home Radio. And it was very difficult for me to come back and forth. So I took a little vacation for three months. No paid vacation, of course. I went to Germany to work in construction hard and to buy myself a car because in Romania were 10 times uh, uh, more expensive. If you have a German car, smart. But you know, I chose to buy a Ford instead. I mean, no offense if you have a Ford. It was, it was okay, it was a Ford Escort. Ah, <laughs> two doors. From the ground, it was a slide, you know. Sport. We have a problem with that. I was very happy with good engine, but uh, we have to push it to start. Uh, I try everything. I change the battery two times. No. You try <laughs> because it was a stick. You have this, you know, if you can push, you, the car is moving and you, uh, uh, in the second gear, you know, you put it there, you push the pedal and uh, it started. If you are over 50, probably you understand that. But. And imagine Carmen and myself going to church Sabbath morning. Yeah. Dress nice. And in the back, you, you, you push the car, Carmen in the back, and I am at the front door, pushing, pushing, moving. It was, uh, we park in such a way, it's a little bit uh, on the hill, you know, hilly. And uh, I was jumping on the wheel, push the pedal <laughs> every single Sabbath morning. Sometimes it was rainy, and we, we live in, in, a, in the middle of, a, a, there are blocks, apartments. And there were a lot of people watching us, you know. It was crazy people doing this Sabbath morning. <sighs> when we move here, we give away a lot of things, and we finally found someone willing to buy my car. It was one of my colleagues from Voice of Hope. And I told him, I want to be honest with you. It's a good car. It's a good mileage, you know, everything. You have to push it. Are you okay with that? He said, it's weird. Let me, let me look. He went there, you know. I, I failed to tell you that I went to two different mechanics. But uh, they said, ah, oh, first change the battery. I, I don't have time for this. No. Ah, you push, it's not a big deal. Yeah. Okay. So he went underneath, moved some things there. He looked under the hood and said, give me the key. <laughs> <laughs> a loose cable. Oh, no. Mike, a loose cable. <laughs> I had that car for almost three years. Loose <laughs> My point is this. We have all the power. It's granted. It's promised. Not just once. And we still push it. Pushing our lives. 
you know, push it, push it, and it's hard, you try hard. And there are some people here, because it's vacation, some people feel, but you know, there are some people in this congregation tired of pushing. And they're home. And they're discouraged. Because they think they cannot push anymore. They cannot push anymore. When you have the power of God propelling your faith, you have a bonus that you never had before, a curse that you never had before, a bonus that is going to move away every mountain of disbelief. Not only Jesus had a new the authority he had, but also knew from where he came and where he was going. His identity. Jesus knew that the Father had hold all things under his power and that he had come from God and was returning to God. This is what the Bible says in verse 3 here and also in verse 1. He came from God, returned to God. He knew the past and he knew his future. He knew his history and he knew his destiny. Sometimes we got confused not knowing our history and not understanding our destiny because the, these two things are tied with our identity. If you don't know from where you came from, where are you going? You struggle to understand who you are. And you let other people tell you that you are just uh, an oppressed man or woman. That you are just uh, a white guy, big deal. Or a black man. Or uh, maybe your gender is different. You look like a woman, but you are a man. You are confused about your identity because you let the outside to draw those lines for you, pointing to some type of identity. And you are bombarded 24-7 by media with news and news and commercials and movies about Jason Bourne or other type of things and you watch Netflix, and you watch this, and Hulu, or that, and that. And one day, once in a while, Sabbath morning, you are coming here, and you listen for 30 minutes a sermon, and you go home, and media, 24-7, again, bomb, bomb, bomb. Do you think it's fair? Are you going to understand who you are? from the Bible or from media and news and movies. We are confused because we don't know from where we got here. Oh, evolution is a fact, evolution is a fact. No, it's a theory, it's a theory, it's not a fact. Oh, maybe some aliens came with flying saucers and populated this earth and blah, blah, blah. The Bible is obsolete. We discovered the missing link. Don't buy that. When I opened the inspired word of God, I discovered that my destiny did not begin to my mother or my father or my grandparents who were Greek Orthodox. When I opened my Bible, I discovered that my destiny did not begin with my grandparents or with uh, uh, some important people in my ancestries. I discovered that I have a beginning in the Garden of Eden 
when God created men and women in his likeness. Let us make humans beings in our image, male and female. My history, my destiny begins in Genesis chapter 1. And probably yours, and not probably, for sure. Well, Lord, I understand the history part, but how can understand my destiny? It looks like we are breathing the breath of life for a little while, then go down six under, no? six feet under, below the ground, dust from dust, ashes from ashes, and no, no. If you look in the book of Revelation, the last three chapters is mirroring, but in reverse, Genesis 1 and 2 and 3, how sin entered the world. Now we discover how sin is getting out of this world, a new beginning, a new beginning. Our history is justification. Our life must be sanctification because our destiny is glorification. I believe that as a church, we are caught in doing this and that, you know, practicing this and that, and we are looking at, you know, evangelicals. Oh, they're against abortions and pro all guns. We should do the same because this is biblical. Uh, you, you look there and yeah, you see on the other side, all the Catholics are against ladies. Uh, well, maybe not against, but I don't know. So we are, we are compelled to, uh, we are uh, going to uh, uh, look in their yard instead of looking in this book and discover the source of power, the source of our uh, authority, the source of our identity. We should not forget that God raised up this church to be the end times prophet movement. I'm embarrassed about it. Everybody is talking about it. It's a cult. God has given us a unique message to be preached and unique lifestyle unique i am a 70 other design i knew i my identity and i respect my brothers lutheran and catholic and pentecostals and baptists i respect them God love is unconditional, no matter the religion, it's true. In the same time, I believe that we have a special mission and a special identity. Amen. 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 Jesus understood where he came from and he understood where he is going. The third thing that Jesus knew, something that we should know also very well, is this. Action. Action. Selfless action is more efficient than just talk. Jesus understood something about the little church with 12 members, his disciples. And here in John chapter 13, uh, 13 they were prepared for the Passover meal. And there was a conversation going around. They were arguing who is going to be the greatest. Who's going to have more FB, uh, uh, Facebook likes, more Instagram followers? Who is going to be a senator or a congressman? in the new kingdom. They have a list, priorities. Uh, imagine, Jesus is the king in the palace. Herod, uh, we should uh, kill him. How about this? Oh, let's change everything. Revolution. They were pulling their resumes and credentials from their suit pockets, comparing themselves with others. Uh, how many doctor's degrees do you have? Peter. <laughs> Peter. He was a fisherman. Well, I am better than you, see? I will be your boss. In their mind, 
where things like power, position, authority, being popular, telling others what to do, because arguing about this, they neglected to appoint a servant who's supposed to serve washing their feet you know, in the beginning, and after that, washing dishes and setting everything back at the very end, according to their custom. Was there a failure or coincidence or part of Jesus' plan? Who knows? And where they are already at the table eating, the fact that there was no servant there revealed that in that 12 members church, no one was willing to serve. Who me? I'm not going to do this, come on. I'm not doing either. Ah, no, sir. Oh, oh. No, not me. Not me. And Jesus was there. Let's watch him. Probably he's going to chastise them. Ah, probably he's going to use this opportunity to have a fiery sermon. Oh. You people, you are terrible. Maybe, uh, maybe he's going to uh, call the deacons and the deaconesses of the church in a special meeting outside, scolding them. What? Maybe calling a panel of theologians from Andrews University, well, I heard about that, <laughs> to debate, you know, for two hours, who is the greatest? What do you think? Jesus didn't say anything. He didn't say a word. But he took selfless action. The Bible tells us that he got up without saying a word. Took off his outer clothing and wrapped a towel around his waist. Oh, Jesus, you are naked here. And after that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with a towel that was wrapped around him. He didn't talk about it. He demonstrated. Demonstrated. He came here to serve because he is the servant. Amen. And the last one. Jesus knew what time it was, what time is. Verse 1. It was just before the Passover feast, and Jesus knew that the time had come. He understood the now. He came down in mission not just to perform some miracles here and there. As a matter of fact, he was expected to perform miracles. Yeah? He was expected to do that. He had the power to do it. But the ultimate goal was a demonstration of God's character. Love and sacrifice for everyone. That was very difficult. <coughs> Power, okay. Moving the mountains, calming the storm, raising the dead. He was God, of course. But how? How to make those 12 people to change? To change? <coughs> Jesus understood that these were the last hours before his departure. And this special time required the full surrender of himself as well. The problem with some of us, we don't know what time it is. We are used to the <clears throat> word end times that we barely pay any attention to the meaning of it. 
If we turn on the news, we should see not just fires in California and uh, floods in Florida with a whole building collapsing with people there where we all sleep. It's such a, such a tragedy. You cannot hear just the Pope being more popular than all the, the telepreachers in the evangelical world put together. We should read the prophetical clock, not just the news clock. We see Matthew 24 being fulfilled right here, right now, and we still don't get it. Because we have a map in our hand, you know. Those will be the events and the Sunday law. Bam, bam, but we are not yet there, so we still time, okay. So we are numb, because we are not capable to think outside of that little plan that we built for ourselves. We're still uncertain what hour is now. Jesus knew that the hour had come, do you? This is not a time to entertain ourselves like the world around us, you know. Movies and football, a time for me to become a social media junkie. It's time to serve, it's time to get ready to leave this world when he's going to be back. Oh, Pastor, I heard this before so many times. Jesus knew his hour, but we don't know our hours. We think we know. Now, look at the scripture. I realize that there is not just an illustration of humility when Jesus washed their feet, but it's also an illustration of what Jesus did in living his throne up here in this fullness of time. He did what? Got up from the meal there in heaven. Yeah? He took his divine nature and he clothed himself with a human nature and he come here you know pour water water means in prophetical um, terms people yes and he began to wash because he is the one who can wash the sins Amen. and after that he did what he put his divine garment and he went out. You see the parallel here? You see? He got up from his royal throne, came here, served, and he went back to prepare a place for you and for me. Here in John 13, Jesus is not just giving an illustration of humility, but also a demonstration of the power of salvation. Let's summarize. Do you know your power? Were you like my, my Ford? Do you know your power? Are you using that power? I discovered my drawer, some sealed batteries. I put there a long time ago. And guess what? Even if they are sealed, if you don't use them, they have no power. I wasted my money when I got them because I didn't use them. Do you know your identity? Are you sure? Maybe you are ashamed of your identity. You don't want people to know. You, you, you go in uh, grocery uh, shops or in hospitals where people must wear ba uh, badges. Yeah? Did you notice something? If they are doctors, the badges are very clear. You know? Doctor so and so. But if they are janitors or uh, nurse aides, they're like that. You cannot read who they are. <laughs> people are ashamed working there. Where they don't know people. Uh, do you know your mission? 
Play golf? What's your mission in life? Do we have a mission in life to begin with? <laughs> Do we have a mission in life? Describe the mission. To keep the Sabbath holy. Oh, it's okay, it's a good beginning. But there's more than this. Hmm? How about God? Because, you know, they are linked here. If you know your power, you will know your identity. Because the power will help refine your identity. And if you know your identity, you are already in mission. And you are already in mission because you know the time is right now. The hour is this one. They are linked. They are connected. They are connected. So my friends, this message today is not just about Jason Bohr and my four. This message is about Jesus Christ. He is supposed to be in the middle. And what he is doing there is not a reason for us to say, wow, but to follow, to do what he did. Otherwise, there's no point. I am wasting half hour explaining stuff, sometimes in plain English, sometimes not. Because my, okay? But if we fail to see that this is about you doing what Jesus did, we don't get it. We don't get it. Now we have this opportunity. To demonstrate something, at least a glimpse, at least a parallel. The same way Jesus washed his disciples' feet, we are invited to do wash someone's feet as a beginning, as a parallel of what we're supposed to do in life in general. So, uh, I, I read some <coughs> scholar papers <coughs> debating about how relevant uh, still uh, food washing. Very few churches are doing this, apart from Seventh-day Adventists. And they said, maybe we should uh, switch to something more relevant for 21st century. You know? Washing someone's uh, car. It is the real side. Yeah, well, uh, I don't know, some, some, something different. Be because washing people was relevant for that culture and not for this culture. Well, begin with this one and do something relevant for our culture this afternoon or tomorrow, whatever. You know, the idea is service and being humble and connect with someone which probably you, don't, you dislike. Not all the time have the communion with, with your, your, your spouse. Maybe you should look for someone who uh, uh, you don't like. Maybe, I don't know. It's just an idea. And we are dismissed right now to do exactly the same thing. We have a place for single ladies, a place for gentlemen, and uh, a place for couples if they want to do it together. And we are invited to be back in 10, 12 minutes, 12 is a good number, for the second part, the bread and the grape juice, because Jesus didn't stop there with the uh, his invitation for people to, it's not just service, it's not just social gospel. He invited them to connect on a transcendental level with him to the symbols of his sacrifice. In the Seventh-day Adventist Church, everybody is invited, uh, no matter if you are a member of this church or not, if you believe that Christ came here to save you and save others from sin, this is your place, this is your place. So come back and, uh, and uh, let's gather 
around the symbols of Jesus' sacrifice. We have one more opportunity to pray and ask forgiveness. So please, let's pray together. Lord, thank you for this ultimate demonstration of your love. Lord, please forgive us. And specific for, for things that we know. We are carrying them as a chip on our shoulder. And as a as a cancer on our characters. Please, Lord, please forgive us, cleanse us, and empower us to have a different life, full of freshness, full of joy, and the joy should come from your presence. Mold our identity better. Help us to tap in that power coming from you. Help us to know our mission and do it. Help us to understand that hey, this is the best time of our lives. This is a unique opportunity to come closer to you as never before. We thank you for your sacrifice. It's not just washing feet, but coming here. What a huge sacrifice. And yes, dying on the cross. Wow. We will never fully comprehend what you did. But the little that we know, please, Lord, help us to put in practice. And to be more like you. Until the day which is coming, you will take us claiming that this is your bride. Thank you in Jesus' name.